All right, welcome back. I hope you had a good break. Our next session is Understanding Governmental, governmental Financial Statements. And this is presented by Stephen Kramer. Stephen Kramer is a certified internal auditor and has been with the Louisiana Legislative Auditor's Office for 13 years. He currently serves as the Senior Advisor in Advisory Services Section. Please welcome Stephen everybody. Uh, so today I want to talk to you all about understanding governmental financial statements. And um, I think this is about a 70 minute uh, presentation. So let's get started. Uh, so in this presentation, what I want to do is run through the types of financial statements, uh, the different components of those financial statements, basic terminology associated with those statements, Differences between governmental accounting and general financial accounting, there are some differences uh, that are unique to governmental accounting. Uh, and probably the most important, you know, is how to read and understand the financial statements and analyzing those financial statements to identify uh, action items. So let's start with what is a financial statement? I'm going to pull up an example so I can show you all uh, up front. So this is one, this is Covington's uh, financial statements for 2019. And mainly we're talking about is down here. Oops. A statement in that position, uh, statement of activities, and other various financial statements um, found in this file. So, the financial statements are formal record of the financial position and financial activities of an entity, in this case, governmental entity. And basically, it's going to show what you what you own, what you owe, in the case of your financial position, or your revenues, expen expenses, in terms of your uh, financial activities. Uh, those financial statements are based on a, st a set of standards called GAAP, General Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. And the reason we have those standards And the reason we have those standards is because uh, to ensure everybody's on the same page as far as what certain items mean, how things are recorded. You can think of those standards like uh, rules for uh, a board game. We have rules so everybody's on the same page. So, uh, so anyway, those financial statements should be reliable, timely, and comparable. And this is important because financial statements are used in decision-making processes. So without reliable financial information, um, you can't make good financial decisions. If the information isn't timely, uh, that means, yeah, you, you just didn't have a chance. You won't have a chance to actually act on that information. And so the key thing is financial statements are a tool to be used and, um, and we'll get into that a little bit later. So management of the entity is responsible for the preparation of the financial statements, including providing, implementing internal controls relevant to the, pres uh, to the preparation and the presentation of the uh, financial statements. Um, for example, uh, example internal control would be say bank reconciliations. These internal controls help ensure that the financial statements are prepared correctly and accurately. So let's talk about financial positions. Um, like I said earlier, it's basically what you own, what you owe, assets and liabilities, and the difference between those two, which is the equity uh, portion of the financial statements. And those are recorded as or presented as of a specific date. And we'll go back to the financial statements of Covington. 
So this is a statement of net position and it shows the financial position of the city as of December 31st, 2019. You'll see it has assets, like we said, things you own, like cash, investments, and so forth. Uh, it has things you owe, which is liabilities, such as accounts payable, customer deposits, those type of things. And then the equity section, which on this set of financial statements is net position, which we'll talk about later. And then you have the financial activity side of the um, financial statement, which is the revenues, expenses, and the difference between the two, which is net profit, net loss, uh, net revenue, net income, various terms for it. And on Covington's financial statements, it is, this is one example of it, where you see where the expenses are. So it shows those activities and it shows various revenues, charges for services, grants. Down here, it shows sales taxes, property taxes, interest. So this is for the year ended December 31st, 2019. So that is for the entire year. That's the cumulative totals for the entire year. While the, while the financial position, as we said, is just for that specific date, which is December 31st, 2019. So uh, let's go ahead and go through the different assets you, you see. Uh, the common ones here are cash, investments, receivables, inventory, capital assets. And you'll see most of these on this set of financial statements. So cash, cash equivalents, basically think of it as your, uh, the cash in your bank. Investments are what they sound like, uh, money you've invested. You have, sometimes you have restricted cash, which is basically cash that has you know, certain legal restrictions on its use. Uh, you have receivables, which is money owed to you by other people. For instance, uh, utility receivables would be money owed to you by utility customers. Uh, you have prepaid expenses, uh, what are the basic expenses you pay in advance like insurance, uh, those type of things. And, uh, and so those are the types of assets you will see typically on a, uh, a set of financial statements. The next part of it is liabilities. And these are very common ones as well, types. Uh, these are things you own, you owe to people, uh, accounts payables, what you owe to vendors, accrued expenses such as uh, payroll you haven't uh, paid out yet, lease obligations, loans, uh, those type of things. And on Covington's financial statements, they can be found in the liability section down here. And as you see, we have accounts payable, which is the amount they owe, uh, owe to vendors as of that December 31st, 2019 date. Uh, you had accrued payroll expenses, so they had payroll they hadn't paid out as of the end of that year. So that was still owed. Uh, you have customer deposits. You'll see that oftentimes with uh, water systems, sewer systems, utility systems in general. These are basically money that customers have put up when they're setting up an account. And since that is not the, uh, the entity's money, they are recorded as a liability, offsetting a liability uh, to show that the uh, entity is holding on to money that is not theirs. Um, and then you have various bonds and capital leases. Uh, and you have net pension liability and net OPEB liabilities down at the bottom, which is just related to retirement liabilities, um, both retirement and uh, health benefits. And then you have financial position, uh, the, the equity side of things. Um, so the terminology varies from the different, uh, uh, but depending on what type of entity you are. You know, for individuals, equity is called net worth. For businesses, you'll have, like, you'll have uh, terminologies like uh, retained earnings, owner's equity. But for governments, we have fund balance and net position. Now, fund balance is going to be uh, for your government fund financial statements. Uh, those will not be found 
uh, your government wide financial statements, which we are looking at. And let me pull that back up. So in this case, we're looking at the government wide financial statements. That's what we've been looking at so far, which shows the, the government's financial position overall across all its funds, across all its services. That's why you see it split into two uh, columns here, both governmental activities and business type activities. So the equity section of, of the government wide financial statements is net position. And under net position, you'll see net investments in capital assets. That's very common. So it's, as it sounds, it's the capital assets uh, minus any accumulated depreciation debt, uh, related debt on that. They have restricted uh, net position, which is just related to rest restricted assets. And then you have unrestricted net position, which would be, will be uh, everything else. So where does all this information come from? Um, basically, it comes from uh, journal entries made in your general ledger. Uh, and of course, that information comes from various subsidiary ledgers, uh, such as uh, utility billing uh, uh, software. Those have your, uh, for instance, those have your uh, different accounts, how much is owed by those people, how much you build out. So all this information gets fed into the general ledger, which is the overall accounting record. And all that information is rolled up into the financial statements themselves. So everything that you see on Covington's uh, financial statements came from the general ledger. It, 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 everything was summarized, pulled in from those different accounts within those ledgers. So why are financial statements important? Who uses them? Uh, the big one here is management uh, of the entities. It's very important that uh, they be used to guide financial decisions. And oftentimes what we see when we go out and talk to many people in local government is uh, the board's not getting financial statements oftentimes. Uh, so they don't, they're basically running blind uh, when they make financial decisions. You know, how much money do we have in the bank? How much can, money can we spend on this project? Uh, those type of questions are hard to answer without a good set of financial statements to understand where you are. Uh, you can kind of think of, you kind of think of financial statements, kind of connect up with the budget, right? So, the um, the budget would, for example, would be your plan for how you where you want to go with with your with your town, so or your entity. So, if we want to create a uh, a new park, we have to budget for the park, and we'll use financial statements to monitor the progress, whether or not we're, we're, we're staying within that plan or not. So that's kind of how the budget and the financial statements are connected. They are, one is the plan, one is telling you how well are you sticking with the plan or do you need to make corrective action? Uh, that's why it's important that management get those um, financial statements. Uh, bankers and creditors use the financial statements as well to evaluate credit worthiness and make lending decisions. So oftentimes you'll see lenders wanting audited financial statements uh, in order to give them a, a, a stronger basis for uh, decisions for lending money to the entity. Uh, stakeholders and investors, uh, mainly stakeholders, thinking of the public. And um, they're the you know, public can look at the financial statements and see how well management is actually using the money that they're giving uh, to the town. Basically, uh, you have taxes, right? Public pays taxes to the entity. How well is management uh, spending those taxes? Are they spending it on the right things? Uh, what is the financial performance of the town or the entity? And so 
those financial statements can be used by the public to, uh, to review that. And then of course, regulators, uh, like for us, we use financial stability, uh, those financial statements to evaluate financial stability. Uh, in fact, uh, we have a large number of entity, uh, data on entities that come to us and we analyze it for trends. We analyze it for financial performance to get an idea of who is struggling out there. And so we use that uh, quite often. So, uh, by the way, the verification code 18 is 4258. That's verification code 18. Our verification code 18 is 4258, 4258. So this shows how management uses the financial statements. Um, and as we talked about the planning, it starts with the planning uh, and that's represented in the budget. So we look at financial information we have, how we've done in the past, what are our needs, how much money we have, and we create a budget out of that. Which goes to budget. And then from there, uh, we have monthly monitoring. That's where the financial statements come in. Now, what we were looking at with Covington's is the annual financial statements. But what management needs is a monthly set of financial statements. And so those will allow management to say, okay, this is what we should be doing according to our budget. And this is how we are actually doing according to our financial statements. So based on those two information, do we need to actually uh, make any changes with the budget? Is our plan still valid? And so those financial statements help uh, provide that answer. Of course, that's end up going into the audit annual financial statements, um, which we're just looking at for Covington. And all that can be used to assess financial stability and it rolls right back into planning. So next year, you're looking at your annual financial statements, seeing where we need to make changes, what, uh, what's a reasonable basis for uh, our projections on revenue uh, going forward and those type of things. So here's some tips when you're for analyzing financial statements. Um, as we talked about, you wanna compare the budget to financial statements throughout the year to help determine the need for corrective action. Uh, it's not, oftentimes I see, it seems like um, some places will take the, will do the budget at the beginning of the year and won't actually monitor it throughout the year. So it, they create a plan for action, but they don't actually monitor where they are with that plan. And so the uh, budget is underutilized. And so it helps if you can actually use the uh, full financial statements to monitor your progress and uh, staying with the budget. Uh, you compare financial statements from different periods to identify important trends, such as decreasing revenue. Uh, this is what I do. Uh, when I'm looking at an entity, seeing where they are financially, I'll look at five years worth of financial statements just to see, okay, is historically, has revenue been going down? Has revenue been going up? Uh, is expenses going up or down? Uh, is, it, is there any concern in the near future for, for financial issues? And those are the type of things I look at. And, you know, management can do the same. Uh, you know, the use of financial ratios and benchmarks to better understand your entity's financial and operational performance to identify areas of improvement. So this is, I use financial ratios extensively in my, um, in my analysis of, of entity's financial health. And so what financial ratios are is, in a sense, a ratio of different fin uh, financial elements. Uh, a common one, for example, could be um, taking cash and dividing it by your, you know, accounts payable or current liabilities. And you do that, that gives you an idea of how well you're covering, how, how well your cash is actually covering your, your liabilities, your, what you have to pay out with the cash. If you see that ratio, if you see that decreasing over, over the years, uh, what that means is over time, your cash, your cash has either been going down or your liability has been going up to extent where you may be in danger of not having enough money to meet your bills. Uh, 
So ratio analysis is useful from that, from that standpoint. Um, and a, a very big one is while looking at financial statements or any financial information, ask yourself, does this information make sense? Um, you know, I heard a story about one place where there was a large theft un uncovered by uh, the attorney for the uh, this entity. What ended up happening is he ended up looking at the financial statements and see and seeing uh, and saw that the entity was spending a lot of money on court reporting fees, like a lot of money, and it just did not make sense to him. And he questioned it, and that helped uncover uh, a fraud at that place. And so, always when you're looking through, don't just accept what you see at face value. Objectively look at it and critically analyze it, and ask yourself: Does this information make sense? And if it doesn't, ask questions. And if it still doesn't make sense, ask more questions. Keep asking questions until you understand uh, what you're looking at. Let's talk about the auditor's role in, in financial statements. So the auditors will have three different levels of uh, financial service, statement services they provide. It'll be, it'll be an audit, a review, and co our compilation. And the difference is it's just based on the level of assurance that uh, each of them give. Uh, the highest level of assurance is for is an audit. And uh, while reviews are a little more limited in their assurance and compilation, you have no assurance, which basically is just the CPA uh, helping put information together in a proper format. So in terms of an audit, which is the highest level of assurance, the primary responsibility of the audit is to obtain and evaluate evidence to form an opinion on whether or not the financial statements are fairly presented in all material respects and in conformity to, with GAAP. So that, that's, yeah, that is the auditor's uh, job. It is to express an opinion on the financial statements, basically telling uh, people, hey, these financial statements are materially correct and where materially means that uh that there's no information out there that would make a significant would make a difference to decision makers um and of course gap we talked about earlier which is the accounting principles uh, so set of set of rules that everybody follows in order to uh, uh to earn conformity uh and of course that opinion is in a written statement, in a written report that accompanies the financial statements. Uh, here we're talking about materiality. Um, like I said, basically it's uh, whether or not the missing information or incorrect information uh, would have an impact on decision, make, on decision makers uh, and the users of financial statement. Uh, we talked about GAAP already, which is just, again, the rules we follow to prepare financial statements to, to account for uh, activity. So there's different types of opinions that auditors can give, uh, unmodified opinions, uh, also known as clean opinion in, informally. But basically it's the auditors saying that they have uh, no concerns about the information included in the financial statement in terms of materiality, um, uh, you know, free of material uh, misstatements. Uh, then you have modified opinions. This is where you don't get a clean opinion, but you actually have some issues with the financial statements. And those different levels of opinions are qualified opinions, adverse and disclaimer. Uh, the qualified opinions, you know, there are mis there'd be misstatements and there's just not significant uh, sufficient evidence to provide a clean opinion. Uh, adverse opinion means that the financial statements do not present fairly, and you know there's both material and pervasive uh, misstatements in them. And disclaimer is where there's just not sufficient audit evidence to actually give an opinion. Uh, basically, the auditor could not do their job of 
given an opinion because they could not obtain enough information to support that opinion. So GASB provides us uh, with the gap for governmental financial statements. Um, they're the only official source of GAAP, and uh, so they are the, the board that actually sets those rules. In Louisiana, uh, we have various levels of financial uh, of, um, audits, reviews, compilations, based on the, uh, the amount of revenue the entity receives. And so that guides what level of, um, of uh, report you'd have to submit to us. So if you have $500,000 more revenue, you have to submit an audit. Two hundred thousand to five hundred, less than five hundred thousand is a review. Compilations are start at uh, seventy-five thousand, go up to two less than two hundred thousand, and then the lowest is the certified sworn financial statements, which is less than seventy-five thousand um, dollars. Most most of the people, most of the entities out there, are going to be in the first three, uh, but we do get certified sworn financials from. Uh, a lot of the smaller entities. And those, of course, are due to us no later than six months after the close of the fiscal year. So there are key differences between the government environment and the private business uh, environment. The ma major one is there's a lack of uh, profit motive, um, Political processes involved in government are unique to that. You know, you have elected officials, appointed officials. Um, you got the power to tax, which of course businesses do not. Uh, and as we said, there's a unique set of, of rules uh, called GAP that uh, that governments have to follow as compared to businesses. And your next. Verification code, which is verification code 19, is 8748. That's verification code 19, 8748, 8748. And this table shows the differences between the financial statements between businesses and governments. Uh, it shows the, the focus of the measurement and the basis of accounting. And most of the basis you're going to see is accrual basis and measurement focuses economic resources. So all businesses follow, follow the accrual economic resources. Wow, you would see that in the government-wide financial statements, uh, proprietary and fund and uh, fiduciary fund statements. The governmental fund statements, which include your general fund, uh, different restricted. Uh, uh, funds, you'll see that in the fund financial statements, which we'll get to shortly. So the annual comprehensive financial report, um, you know, it's encouraged but not required. And it does have disclosures uh, that go beyond just the minimum uh, requirements of provided by GAAP, uh, additional statistical reports, basically. Um, and it basically, it helps management demonstrate the spirit and uh, of transparency to taxpayers. It allows for more disclosure. More information is always a good thing. Uh, the more information you can provide to taxpayers about how the money is being spent, what, how the government is operating, um, the more trust it builds with those taxpayers. And of course, it's not required to get the GFO, CAFR is required to get the GFOA's uh, Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. And in fact, Covington, I believe, did get, get that this year, or this particular year. There it is. So that's their Certificate of Achievement of, uh, for Excellence in Financial Reporting. So I'm going to uh, 
run through the different financial statements and the contents of, of this uh, annual financial report. We talked about the, I'll start with the, uh, MDNA up here. Suction. So here is the auditor's report on the uh, annual financial reports. This is where the auditor expresses the opinion on, on that report. And it goes through and exp uh, explains the, uh, the responsibility of the auditor. And down here, there's an opinion paragraph where the, the auditor is saying that the financial statements referred to above, which is uh, Covington's financial statements, uh, is presented fairly in all material respects. Uh, it goes on. So that is the auditor's opinion that we were talking about earlier. So that's where he reports it in, in the uh, auditor's report. And those are usually found at the front uh, of the uh, financial statements or the financial report. Then you have Management discussion and analysis, also called MDNA, and it's just uh, allows man it's management's discussion of uh, the financial health, financial performance of the town. It allows management to provide additional information um, to the users of the financial statements, such as the public, uh, uh, to explain, to provide just additional information, uh, provide additional transparency. Uh, so. Those are also usually come before the financial statements. And so let's talk about the base. So, hmm? yeah, so the CFR, yeah. And so the, uh, used to be called the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report is now called the Annual Comprehensive Finan Financial Report. It's, they changed it from CAF or CAFR to ACFR. And so that's what this report is now uh, referred to as. So we talked about the MDNA, which is management discussion analysis. We started talking about the basic financial statements, and let's get back to that. Um, as I talked about earlier, this is a statement in that position. This is for the government-wide financial statements. It's the government, as it, it, as it sounds, it's government-wide. It's the overall government's financial statements, it includes all the activities, uh, government activities and business type activities broken down between assets, liabilities, again, things you, you own and things you owe, uh, generally speaking. And uh, this is where you see, this is where you go to see, okay, where do we stand right now financially? How much money do we have in the bank? How much do we owe, the, uh, owe our vendors? This is where you go to answer that question. And down at the bottom, like I said, we have net position, which is basically the net worth of the, uh, the, uh, the government entity. It's the difference between your assets and your liabilities. It's what's left over, you could say. Um, next set of financial statements, are, well, here's the statement of activities, which is the income statement for the government-wide financial statements. It shows the expenses, charges for services, which is the revenues, uh, sales taxes. It also shows how much is left over once the expenses were paid. And that can be seen in the change in net position. So that's government-wide financial statements. Now, what follows is a more um, uh, closer view of the governmental activities and the governmental funds. Now, of course, as we said, that, that's based on a different set of um, a different financial reporting model. This is based on modified accrual, while the government-wide is full accrual accounting. 
Um, but you'll see that here you have the, your general fund and you have various other restricted funds or special revenue funds rather, uh, non major governmental funds. And again, this is the balance sheet, which is similar in nature to the statement of net position above, and that it shows the assets and liabilities, those things you own, those things you owe at the fund level, at the governmental fund level. And in this case, the, the net worth, the uh, net position, you could say, is, it, is called fund balance in governmental fund financials. So it's different from net position. There's, uh, in terms of uh, the different categories, you have non-spendable, for instance. That's, as it sounds, things you can't spend. You have restriction, a restricted uh, fund balance. Those, the amount of fund balance that's restricted uh, legally for certain purposes. Uh, you have committed and assigned fund balances, and those are based on board uh, restrictions and board uh, decisions. And then you have the unassigned fund balance, which is everything else, which just has not been assigned. So, the next thing you see, um, uh, there we go. So here you see the statement of net position for the proprietary fund. Now this is, again is on full accrual, just like the government wide one was. Um, same in that position shows the assets, liabilities, things you own, things you owe, and the difference between the two uh, for the proprietary fund. Now, the proprietary fund uh, uh, represents um, activity related to things you provide for uh, services, you, external services you provide for charges, such as utilities. Uh, so and that's what you'll find in the proprietary fund statements. You'll see the statement of revenue, expenses, change in net position. You know, again, this is the in income statement for the proprietary fund. It shows the operating revenues, operating expenses. Uh, if there were any non-operating revenue, non-operating expenses, you see that here. Um, transfers and change in net position, which is the difference between what's coming in the fund versus what's leaving the fund. Um, one thing to note here with the expense is depreciation. And oftentimes that's confusing to people who see that uh, present on financial statements because a lot of times they, people we equate that to, okay, my car depreciated, my value went down. In accounting, depreciation doesn't really represent the uh, uh, decrease in fair market value of the assets as much as it it represents the allocation of the cost of a capital asset over time. So instead of, you know, putting the entire cost of an, of an asset, capital asset, such as uh, a piece of equipment in the expenses, you know, in the year you purchased it, what account, we do in accounting is we say, okay, well, this, for example, this equipment may last us 10 years. So we try to split it up among those years. So that's what depreciation represents. Just an allocation of, of expenses. And come up fiduciary. And you have statement of cash flows as well with proprietary fund, which is just a, a schedule showing uh, the different uses of cash. Uh, for example, depreciation is not a cash item. Uh, you know, you don't pay out depreciation to anybody each year. Uh, so it focuses just on the changes of cash, the statement of cash flow uh, does. Uh, then there's a statement of fiduciary net position, uh, which 
you know, it's just reports money that are held in custodial trustee capacity for third party, uh, for, such as employees retirement system. Uh, I think that's the main, main one I've seen. Um, but it just, it's not, this is not the entity's money. So it's separately reported in a fiduciary uh, deposition uh, or fiduciary statements. And again, this shows the deposition of those fiduciary funds and it shows the changes in those funds. Uh, revenue expenses are, you know, inflows, outflows. Uh, so the next section of the financial statements is the, the notes. So the notes are actually uh, very important. So they, they actually provide you additional information that's not available in the financial statements themselves. Uh, it gives you information on different accounting policies, how things are being treated. Uh, it provides more information on, on different parts, uh, different numbers within the financial statements. So we get down past the summary of uh, accounting principles, policies, and um, show you all the capital assets, for instance. So uh, here's a note on the capital assets figure. While, while above in the financial statements, it's just one number on financial statements. Here, it shows you a breakdown of what that number consists of. You, know, you have land, you have construction progress, you have buildings and you know, the money invested in those, uh, cost of those improvements, um, you have accumulated depreciation. So that's the, that's, the, that's the total of the depreciation expense each year, uh, all, you know, to date. Uh, or, you know, to date, including previous years, it, it's accumulated. So it, it adds it to it each year and changes each year. And, um, and so this is an example of what the notes of the financial statements could provide you. It provides just additional information to help you better understand what's being presented. <clears throat> and your next verification code, which is verification code number 20, is 5264. That's verification code 20, 5264. We can go further down and, and see other information presented in the financial statement are in the notes. So you have uh, information on long-term debt and liabilities. So while those might have represented a few numbers above, you can actually find out information about the debt. So we see it's a, one of their debt is a serious 2011 refunding bond. You can see how much was all authorized issue, uh, the initial issue and amount, how much is still outstanding. Oftentimes, there's descriptions of those debts, um, further descriptions of those debts uh, in narrative form. And so the point of all this is that there's information here that is, uh, that can help, help you better understand the information provided in the financial statements. And again, the more information you have, uh, you know, the easier it is to make good decisions on that, on that information. Funds, special revenue funds. I think we covered all this. Uh, balance sheet. Mm -hmm. One second. Catch up. And so we'll just continue going down these financial statements.
So continue looking down through the notes. Um, do I have information about the retirement plans for the different um, different retirement systems the government is involved in? Um, do I have some other disclosures down towards the bottom? Uh, OPEB disclosures, which is related to retirement health benefits. Uh, So, and that's the end of the notes. So with your interim financial statements, that's the financial statements you would get on a monthly basis. Um, what you're mainly gonna see is just the financial statements. Um, at least that's what most of the entities I deal with, uh, with that have financial statements use. Um, so you won't have may not have this level of detail available on a monthly basis, but um, you'll have basically the same type of information available, which is your assets, your liabilities, where you stand uh, financially, basically. How much revenue and expenses you got during the year uh, and how are you doing, how are you doing compared to the budget? And so those type of analysis, uh, that type of information is important for the decision makers. Um, going further down, you also have some additional information um, regarding uh, in your government financial statements regarding uh, pay to board members, council members, uh, compensation to the agency head, in this case of the mayor. So it breaks down uh, how much the mayor was making, uh, benefits, car allowances, et cetera. Uh, you have statistical information, which provides additional information uh, on the financial statements. towards the bottom of that, you'll have audit findings, which is the last section uh, we'll going to discuss with those financial statements. And this is where you'll find where the auditor has provided uh, written, basically written up findings with concerns about uh, the practices or the financial statements themselves and provided recommendations for the correction of those financial statements. Um, again, the notes are important. It provides additional information uh, for the financial statements. Uh, we talked about the MDNA, which helps provide um, additional management's analysis, additional information from management on those uh, financial statements to, to, uh, to the public. It's where they can actually help with the, their transparency. Uh, talk about other supplemental information. Uh, talk about the internal auditor's report, schedule findings. Uh, uh, next verification code is verification code 21. That's 4747, that's verification code 21, 4747. Uh, you do have a summary of uh, prior year findings. So I showed you the current year finding schedule and you'll find uh, the prior year schedule there as well. So basically the auditor has to follow up on their prior year findings to determine the resolution of them. And that's where you'll find it at. And I think we may be done early. So um, do we have any questions? Okay. And verification code 22 is 4585. That's verification code 22, 4585, 4585. Thank you, and, um, and that's all for this presentation. Then. Well, we have uh, Diane Allison actually has some input to uh, for this presentation.
start the video again. Okay, thank you, Stephen, for that absolutely terrific presentation on, a, um, on an annual comprehensive financial report. And I also so much wanna thank Covington for letting us use their report as a, a model for this presentation. The one thing I, th I thought about a lot of things during this presentation, and um, one of the things I thought about that confuses me and I think many others is, um, um this right here so um why is there a difference between accrual and modified accrual and what really is that difference so um to explain it to you especially the ones on our board and a lot of people that serve on our governing bodies know some things because they may have run a business they may have run a section of a business they may get um budget reports um, that they have to monitor a budget every time. And so when they see the things on government financial statements, they really have to be like taught, like this is not business. So let's talk about why it's not business. Business has a profit motive. And so they use economic resources. And what does that mean? What that really means is that means everything that you have, that means that it means your short-term assets and your short-term liabilities like cash and accounts payable and payroll payable but it also means long-term assets and long-term liabilities so what are our long-term um, assets Stephen showed us a bunch of those and the note disclosure on the um, capital assets and that's basically what they are they're your long-term things like your land your buildings, your vehicles, all that equipment that you have in city of Covington, you saw the um, infrastructure and what is infrastructure to a city? What that is, is their roads and their bridges and their sidewalks and their parks and all of those things. So a business also has those. And the difference between that and current financial resources is that current financial resources are only short term assets and short-term liabilities so let's go down a little bit further for this because i think this is really really key to helping us understand our budget to actual and everything else so on current financial resources we leave out our buildings we leave out our land we do not have city hall on a governmental fund financial statement we do not have all of those roads and bridges that the city of covington had on our governmental fund financial statement why don't we and here's why the government motive is to provide a service you get to drive on the streets of the city of covington and you don't have to pay any tolls you don't have to pay any fees they provided a service of those roads so in business if my asset if my building if my equipment is not earning um a return on my investment some of y'all know what that is and you've had to calculate it return on investment, I'm selling it. I am not tying up my money in a piece of equipment that is obsolete. I'm gonna sell it or a building that's in a, that's in a part of town that's now changed the zoning and the building isn't generating income for me. I'm gonna sell my building and I'm gonna use my money somewhere else. A government does not have that choice. A government only has the choice of they provide a service we can't sell city hall because in a COVID time less and less people are coming to city hall because they're using our phenomenal website to conduct the transactions with the city that they want to conduct so um we can't sell city hall we can't do that i come from 11 years at a school district in a school district we have a ton of buildings but we don't charge any um, tuition in public school districts. So we're providing a service. So it's not fair to judge a government based on its return of investment on its long-term capital assets. 
and how those are turning money over for them. That's the biggest, biggest difference between those two. And that's also the biggest, biggest difference between the government-wide financial statements and the fund level financial statements. So in government, every single month, I'm gonna pause and tell my team, y'all watch me for a time because um, I'm in my zone and I'm just so passionate about this stuff and I love it. So for a government, when we're looking at our budget, our budget has things like, let me give you a perfect example. Um, I have a, in my, debt in my debt service budget, I have to pay principal and interest. I issued bonds and I have to pay principal and interest um, I used to have to pay them due on September 1, and then I had to pay interest again on March 1. At the fund level, guess what those things are called? They're called an expenditure. Why? Because it's an outflow of funds. But debt, that's 20-year debt that I'm paying on. Debt is a long-term liability. So at the government-wide level, I'm not really having an an expenditure on an income statement when I made my principal payment. I am really reducing that liability. And that's the difference between those two. So what you expect to see in a budget, and a lot of us will pay our debt service out of our, um, if our debt service is backed by, by debt that um, is in our general fund, um, then a lot of times we will pay it out of our general fund. So you will see debt service payments out of your general fund. That's weird. That's just weird. And so the people who come from the for-profit world say, wait a minute, that reduces the amount you owe. That's not really an expenditure out. But for us at the fund level, we're saying, no, 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 because I'm writing a check um, for, those, for those principal payments. And that's why. That's a big, big difference for us to um, be able to understand with the financial statements. And then um, let me go to slide 28 um, right here. So um, the fund types and as, as Stephen, you know, really, really talked to us about proprietary and fiduciary fund types. And um, we do need to update this slide also because um, we know that number four is now called custodial funds with the advancement of, um, with the approval of GASB 84. So um, our, on our governmental funds that go by that modified accrual that what we wanna see, those are the kinds that we have. And just to give you a brief you know, description, general fund is none of the others, okay? It's just the general operations. Special revenue, there's no requirement in um, the, gov the GAP, the generally accepted accounting principles literature to have special revenue funds, but a lot of us accountants, we really, really want these because we really wanna segregate our grant money and we will segregate our, our state grant money and we will segregate our federal grant money. So you all have heard a presentation this morning on the American Rescue Plan Act. You've also heard Jennifer Shea tell us this morning that um, there's a lot of money floating around there might be FEMA money from Hurricane Ida. There might be CARES Act money still floating around. And now we have ARPA money. To a lot of accountants, we want to record that we want to put those in three um, in special revenue funds, three distinct ones. Capital projects, um, those are the funds where we use to build the big capital projects. So why do we do that? Because uh, coming from a, an accountant who had to present financial statements to my governing board, because when I had a big, huge construction expenditure, then that will throw off my general fund, throw off my budget to actual, and um, would absolutely drive me nuts. So we, sec we segregate our construction over in capital projects so it doesn't flow off, um, it doesn't mess up our budget to actual variances that we're looking at every month. They just throw there, and you know, they come and go, like you build City Hall and now it's done, right? And now you're on to the next thing. And the next thing you build may just be a parking lot. And that's gonna be different from building a whole building in that. Debt service, we talk about that as the payment of your principal and interest. And um, there are two, you also have in there your reserve funds. Sometimes when we issue debt, we're required to have the bond covenant ha has us to have a reserve fund to set up. And then permanent funds are our endowments. So on the proprietary side, the proprietary funds, enterprise funds, these are ones for all of you guys on the governing body that we hope you're, you're um, enjoying this presentation. 
Um, these are the ones that you will definitely identify with the most because it's the profit motive. And as Stephen explained, that's a lot for utilities. And it can be some, some um, governments rent out a building. They may have a building and they lease out space to others. That would be proprietary. So the two things on proprietary funds, you have to have a for-profit motive and you also have to do something that is done in the commercial world. So let me give you an example of that. Long ago and far away, I was the senior, my first governmental job, I was the senior accountant, I think I was called, it doesn't matter, for civil court in New Orleans. And civil court in New Orleans, 21 years ago, had court fees. So this is civil court. So if, if Stephen and I are, are having a disagreement over whose money that is, we're going to go, someone's going to sue somebody, we're going to go to civil court. It's voluntary. So if I'm going to sue Stephen, I'm going to go file a court filing fee. And I'm going to sue Stephen, and I think I'm right, and it's going to go through the process. And my first initiation into governmental accounting was I thought that was an enterprise fund. That's an enterprise fund, no taxes, no fees. It's purely um, filing fees from filing a lawsuit and, and whatever, all the, all the other documents. And David Bean, you all know David Bean. He was the, the, the longtime executive director of the GASB, and he just recently retired this year. And David Bean explained to me, he said, it's not an enterprise fund because it doesn't compete with the for-profit world. So that really, so when you think about your enterprise fund, it is your utilities and, and um, parking garages, maybe if you charge to the outside world. Internal service funds are what we charge in governments to each other. And so um, one department to another. So a perfect example of that for a lot of the larger governments that are self-insured, you may be self-insured for your workers' compensation. You may be self-insured for your employee health insurance. Then those are in, in internal service funds. And their motive is not a profit motive. Their motive is just to cover the cost of providing that service. And then our fiduciary funds, um, we have pension and, and, and um, other post-employment benefit trust funds, and we have investment, um, investment trust funds, and then we have private purpose trust funds, and now our new category is custodial funds, and that's a whole nother discussion, very different from agency funds. So I just wanted to bring that out to you um, so you can see. Another thing that I want to say out there to all our wonderful accountants out there in um, Louisiana and all of our board members, when you look at that statement of net position, and Stephen talked about the importance of that equity number, and when that equity number nowadays for a lot of governments that issue debt is going to be negative. And I, this was my, I'm just going to tell you a story. My midlife crisis was GASB 68. So GASB 68 came out. I was working at the Ascension Parish School Board as their CFO, and I had to record this huge, gigantic liability on my um, financial statement. And I had to put it on my statement in net position because the school boards participate in the teacher's retirement system and the school employees retirement system. And those are statewide retirement systems. Some also have employees that participate in the, in the lasers retirement system. Those are statewide. And I had, that was the year I had to put my share of the whole big old unfunded liability on my financial statement at Ascension School Board. And it made me go negative on my net position. And I called up Suzanne Elliott and at the Legislative Auditor's Office. And I said, Suzanne, I said, this is negative. Oh no, am I gonna have an audit finding um, because of negative net position? She said, no, Diane. And I said, oh, well then I know what I'm gonna have. I'm gonna have a going concern note disclosure because you don't want net equity to be negative. That means you owe more than you own. Okay, and Suzanne said, no, Diane, you're not even going to have that. And just being so smart, and I think I know it all, I'm like, okay, I got this. They'll just do an emphasis of a matter. And Suzanne said, no, Diane, you won't have that either. And here's why. It was a brand new accounting standard that came out. And because it is so far in the future, and also, uh, and I'm saying things about GASB 68 that I don't want to get too much into, but summarizing for y'all, to say that it because of the nature of that liability 
there's no problem with me going negative. And I remember when I had to go before my governing body, my wonderful school board, and explain to them that the, um, that the negative net position is there because of that accounting standard. So let's just say some people, when they have a midlife crisis, they go get like a red Corvette. Okay, and some do a lot of other things. So Diane Allison has an explosion over implementing GASB 68 on her financial statement. So I know y'all are saying get a life, but that was my great big um, midlife crisis for that. And now go, let's go forward and let's go with GASB 75. What did that make us do? That made us put our other post-employment benefits also on the statement of net position at the government-wide financial statements for that. So that even added more fuel to the fire. And what that is basically, um, to just really, really summarize at a high level. So um, when we hired our cute little graduate at um, college graduate at the age of 23, and when we hired her, we said, we are gonna give you these, these benefits if you stay here and you retire. For example, if you were at City of Covington, if you retire from the City of Covington, you'll be able to participate in our pension. But other than pension, because it's other post-employment benefits, oh, you, you can have life insurance. You'll be able to buy life insurance your whole time with us as a retiree. You'll be able to participate in our health insurance plan as a retiree. So GASB 75 made us change the way we record that cost. Right now, what we do and at the fund level what we do is every month we get a bill from let's say blue cross or whoever it is that's doing our health insurance and it's the bill for retirees and we write a check most of the time out of our general fund okay and we just call it retiree health insurance well gasby 75 made us say no you actually need to fund the cost of those promises that you made to that little 23 year old that you hired that you're going to pay when she's like call her 63 and she's worked there 40 years or 30 years or however long she's worked there and you now need to book that but not only that you need to estimate what that is for her and then you need to discount it back to present value this is the stuff the actuaries do because they have fun with this stuff they discount it back to present value and they and we book we have to book the current year's cost for those promises to all of our employees so that's what it is why is that important i'm going to tell you that that's important because as a governing body member what gasby wanted you to understand is you have control of that that is a huge great big gigantic number you've made promises you may not be able to keep but it's not unlike the teachers retirement um, re retirement system, this is within the control of the local government. And we can say, you know what? I can no longer afford to pay all of that health insurance as a retiree, like the full cost. So I might reduce, consider reducing my benefit and, and starting some date, some higher date. After that, I'm gonna reduce that benefit and get it to within something that we can. So the Governmental Accounting Standards Board had those two great big statements. And we have two more coming up on leases and cloud computing, which basically says these big liabilities that they didn't used to be on your financial statement, you need to put them on. And so for a lot of governments, that's our roundabout way of saying for a lot of governments that they went to negative net position. It hurt my little Diane feelings. It hurts my little Diane feelings to this day because being a good financial manager, I wanna look at my financial statements and I wanna do something about the stuff that's wrong. And one more point to make in the couple of minutes I have left is to remind you about, Stephen talked about monitoring and, and Mike did too, monitoring your financial statements, looking at your budget and comparing it with your actual results. What you need to look there, they both pointed out variances. What I wanna point out in the variances is look at the major variances, okay? Not a little bitty variance, a major variance. How would you define a major variance? You may have it different from me. I start at a 20% off. This is over budget by 20%. So true story, I'm, I'm known for telling true stories. True stories, I have a financial statement and my copy machine expense is way over budget. And um, so, I'm, of course, I blow a gasket because copy machines are easy. It's this much a month, 
You can separate it out by 12. Let's say it's a thousand bucks a month. You pay 12,000 a year. Um, I know some of y'all are saying you wish because it costs more than that, but just go with me on this. So let's say in one month, I have $2,000 on that. It blows off my budget by how much? 100% because I budgeted 1,000 and I spent 2,000. So what does that mean? I need to explain that major variances. And the first time I had to explain that major variance, I said, oh, we recorded two months of copy machine expense in one month. So now I never want to say that again. So now we went back and our accounting team would look at that and say, let's set up some accruals when that happens. So for whatever reason, we got that wrong, but let's set up some accruals so that I don't have to explain a major variance due to timing. Another reason I'll tell you for a big major variance has a lot to do with the timing of those professional services contracts. So um, you may have a professional services contract and it's gonna, you've budgeted $50,000 but you don't know over what period of time it's gonna be done. So maybe it's gonna be three months. And so in the first month, you budget $10,000 and in the second month, maybe 20 and in the third month, 20. But what happens in the first month, they actually are ahead of schedule and they bill you for 15 or 20,000. Well, now you're off. That is that explanation to the governing body and always ask for this information is that yes, I'm over budget. I have a major variance and I'm over, but here's the deal. It is for an item that was approved and that was budgeted and it's just a timing issue. So for year to date, we are not over budget. Everything is good, we've got this. And so I just wanna thank you so much for participating in our, um, in our presentation on understanding financial statements. We hope it wasn't too technical. We really hope it was useful for you. And I'm gonna turn it over to Judy Detwiller Who's gonna, who um, Lizzie is going to introduce, and then you'll get to hear about Act 87. Thanks.